Hello, BookTube. Recently, David Wiley started a series of videos on his channel. Uh, I'll leave a link to one of them down below. His Bookshelf Essentials, where he looks at his bookshelves that are crowded with books, just like yours are, just like mine are, and he sees some books that really jump out. Some books where the rest of these could come and go, have come and gone, but you, you I want. You are essential to me. I love that idea. I know that all book people have those tiers. I know very few book people. I know a lot of book people who have told me over the years and the decades that what they plan to do is eliminate anything in their collection that isn't a bookshelf essential. And I have also had that plan many, many times. I've never done it. I've never met a book person who did it. So uh, I also have bookshelf essentials. And I want to show you another one today. This is uh, probably the single greatest treasure that might be moldering in your grandparents' attic, that might be five for a dollar at your your yard sale in the spring. These are these are perhaps the greatest treasures that people don't know are treasures. And they are books by National Geographic. The great magazine, National Geographic, has forever and ever made books. They started out making books of their own, compiling their issues, but then they started compiling thematically. They would go through their magazine and pull out articles that have come out month by month on similar subjects, put those all together in a book, maybe commission a couple of new articles, a new introduction, new artwork, and a whole bunch of extras, timelines and diagrams and whatnot, and put those together in a series of books. And those books are incredible. They are incredible. <laughs> and I want to show you what I'm talking about. This is the volume for Greece and Rome, uh, for instance. We've got the National Geographic uh, imprimatur on the side there. And you've got their beautiful photos all throughout as they go through. This is, this is uh, you get separate articles. There's a world of Pericles. These are very uh, applicable, general interest history, commuter history, what a friend of mine used to call. This is not for the specialists, but a specialist will, won't find much that's wrong with these because specialists help to write them. You get original artwork uh, in these. You get tons and tons of photography of the pertinent area. So here you get Greek art. You also get uh, Roman ruins and Roman aqueducts. You get uh, fold-out maps. Here are the journeys of Alexander the Great. You also get, if you're lucky enough to find them, if you, if you look around at your yard sale, there's the Trajan's column there when you get to the Roman part, you also can get uh, a bigger feature in the back, folded in in the back, a huge fold-out map. In this case, the chronology, the, the uh, family tree of the gods. Uh, just an elaborate thing. This is a National Geographic wall map. On the one hand, you get the gods, and on the other hand, you get the ancient world. Uh, and it, it, sometimes you will find, if you look at these things, sometimes you will find that the... Uh, that the maps have been pillaged. Oh, God. <laughs> the map is all oh God. Oh, does this bring back memories? This does not happen with Google Maps. <laughs> Here, I'll fix that. I'll fix that later. Uh, sometimes you will find in these old volumes that the maps have been pillaged. That the map is gone. But the rest of the book is there. That's really loathsome. But uh, collectors will sometimes do that. They, are, they tend to be loathsome people. Uh, you will also get signs of previous owners. <laughs> And these range throughout, so these are not a narr this is not a narrative history. Instead, it ranges throughout. You will get, you will stop at Pericles, you will stop at Alexander the Great, you will stop at Julius Caesar, and you get a uh, a uh, great National Geographic artwork, uh, photography, great original artwork. There's the the guy finishing the first marathon. <laughs> he's he's pretty tired. You would be too. Uh, and you get uh, thoughts. I won't say scholarship, but you get thoughts by some of the leading experts about these subject matters. It's uh, an absolutely delightful combination of things. And it did well for National Geographic. They, people really liked these books. Uh, a lot of people back in the 1950s liked these things because these things gave them license, or rather gave their long-suffering wives license, to throw away the mountains of old National Geographic issues. If you've got the best, if you've got the stuff you really like in these volumes, then you don't need to keep all of those issues and go hunting through them. So National Geographic did a lot. They did, here is, here is uh, Wild Animals of North America. 
I've only ever seen this once, so mine is in pretty rough shape. Um, this has tons of photography, but also tons of beautiful original artwork. Uh, original from National Geographic, drawn from their, from their issues. And then this one is This England. Uh, which takes you all throughout England from the era of Bede to the era of Chaucer to the era of Shakespeare. Shows you all these great period photographs of people uh, doing all the stuff that they do. <laughs> Walking around, sometimes sometimes going through these earlier issues will uh, startle you. In one, I think it's in this volume or maybe in a, in a National Geographic issue about England that, that didn't make it into this volume. There are all kinds of pictures of people and when they get to a special article in parliament there's a junior parliamentarian eagerly sticking out a hand to shake your hand named what was it tony blair <laughs> uh you get something like that you get broader uh looks at sweep sweeps of history so greece and rome is one the age of chivalry is another uh you get uh, the end papers there are uh sort of a, a working look with cutaways of a keep, of a castle keep. You get uh, the Renaissance uh, with tons and tons of great photos, great artwork. Look at that. Just lovely. One thing you can count on National Geographic for is beautiful photography. Uh, and just considerations. You get considerations of, of everything that's going on here. When you get to St. Peter's Basilica, uh, the, the, of course, the page has to fold out because it's, and if you've ever been there, it's a fairly enormous space. Uh, but it wasn't just history that they did, obviously, since the Wild Animals of North America isn't history. They did all sorts of nature things, too. And those are also wonderful. There's a, a box set here. I have a second copy of Nor Wild Animals of North America here that's in beautiful shape. Uh, <coughs> That's probably 60-year-old dust that's making me sneeze. Uh, this set here is uh, Animals. And it has the Wild Animals of North America as one volume, and then the Marvels of Animal Behavior. And there is uh, me and Deb, our third or maybe fourth honeymoon. <laughs> you get those two volumes in this slipcase. Uh, and the same thing is true with this one here. This is about birds. So you get song birds and uh, song and garden birds of North America. And then water, prey, and game birds. Birds that uh, kill other birds and also birds that, that hunters in the 1960s and 70s wanted to kill. And these are full of beautiful illustrations. Just wonderful, big, hard covers. Uh, and then uh, my two favorites. <laughs> I'll finish up with my two favorites. One is Man's Best Friend. <laughs> Which has everything that you would want. It has tons and tons of great pictures. Uh... Let's see here. Yeah, there is uh, an airman and a farm boy with their with their faithful dogs. <laughs> and think about that airman's long dead. That farm boy is probably long dead. Uh, you have yes, an Eskimo with uh, dogs that will work for a living but be very well treated. They'll be very happy. Uh, you get casual sketches to start individual chapters, and of course, because this is <laughs> because this is. Uh, a dog book, you also get broken down by breeds. <laughs> you get a, a, everything broken down by breeds, including uh, the miniature schnauzer, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> the heavy beard that all but hides the muzzle of the miniature schnauzer provides him with a comic opera mask behind which he can plan his endearing mischief undetected. <laughs> this playful little dog loves to be with people. He'll shun his own kind any time for a chance to consort with and tease his human friends. Derived from his much larger cousin, the standard schnauzer, by way of a cross with a toy breed, the often pincher, the miniature does not share the blood and inheritance of British terriers. However, his efficiency as a vermin killer more than qualifies him for the title of terrier. In his native Germany, he maintains a proud reputation as a ratter. The schnauzers are the only terrier that does not derive from England. They derive from Germany. Uh, which explains a lot. <laughs> uh, although the miniature schnauzer is peace-loving by nature, long, powerful jaws and a strongly muscled body equip him to take care of himself in a scrap. His harsh, wiry coat is a characteristic pepper and salt color. Bred in the United States since 1925, the little schnauzer makes a sensible watchdog, intelligent and alert, but his fondness for human companionship makes the role of pet the one he loves best. 
<laughs> I couldn't help but go to that. And once upon a time, if you had told me that when I got a, a dog breed book, I was going to go to miniature schnauzers. There they are. There's a brace of them right there. I wouldn't have believed you. I would have gone to beagles instead forever and ever. Uh, this is a delightful volume. The thing about these National Geographic volumes, National Geographic still makes books, but the thing about these volumes is that they don't make them anymore. They don't reprint them. I bet there'd be a market if they did, but they don't. So you have to go to yard sales and, and use bookstores or maybe online. I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea if these things are collectible online. I don't want to know. And then uh, the last one we'll finish up with here. Years and years and years ago, I knew uh, someone who was embarked on uh, a workaday history, a real market-driven history of the American book trade. A massive subject, very recondite subject, not the straightforward thing you would think to research at all. And uh, he used to come over to refuel himself with wine and calzones regularly. And uh, when this subject came up, as it did, he always used to bemoan my what he called my plebeian pedestrian taste in books. Uh, but when this subject came up, he used to say that this volume was the best-selling volume that uh, National Geographic Books ever made. And that's Men, Ships, and the Sea. Uh, which is, uh, again, just a marvel. You have, here's the anatomy of a steamship. That is your end papers. Uh, and I believe the end papers on the front is the anatomy of a sailing vessel. Yes, the, the, the end papers on the front are the anatomy of a sailing vessel. You get uh, maps and illustrations here, period illustrations of all the different periods of men, ships, and the sea. All the different kinds of equipment that are involved. Look at that. <laughs> the quest for speed. Uh, that friend told me that this sold better even than the dog book for National Geographic. They couldn't get enough of this. So it wasn't just me and Mark Richardson, <laughs> just so you know. It wasn't just the two of us. And this shows you a wide selection. I do not have the Bible Times one, and I do not have the World Religion one. I kind of wish I did. The Brattle will provide. I will see both of those. I have most of these, and I love them. The thing about them is I go back to them. You wouldn't think I would, because I, I am not a general interest history reader anymore. Uh, but I do. There's something about the wonder of these things, something about the suburban education element of them that I just love. Plus, all the stops are pulled out in terms of production. They are beautiful productions. So, <laughs> so that is my, uh, my bookshelf essential for today. It is National Geographic Books. Your eye at a, at a flea market or whatever might pass right over these things, you shouldn't. If you see a box of these that somebody's clearing out an attic for, or if you maybe have an old attic that you haven't looked in, go and see if you can find a copy of one of these things, because they are treasures. They are wonderful. They just aren't made anymore and uh, aren't really thought of anymore. Uh, I'm not going to look on eBay. <laughs> I don't want to know if these things are somehow weirdly collectible, because that depresses me. When I see that, it depresses me, because that means they're being bought up by people who aren't going to read them, who aren't going to enjoy them. It weren't going to batter the hell out of them, which I've done to mine many, many times. Uh, but anyway, that's my bookshelf essential for today. <laughs> I would love to hear, actually, I would love to hear if you have any of these. Or if there are any other fans out there. I know that Mark Richardson loves uh, men, ships, in the sea. But I don't know if there are any other fans out there, and I'd love to. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.